to our uh, conference today. Let me begin by just briefly going over a little bit more detail about the SEED, uh, Seed Plus program. The Susquehanna USA Emerging Expert Delegation, or SEED, program seeks to engage the next generation of U.S. policy experts on Japan and improving their understanding of U.S.-Japan relations. The program offers its participants a series of pre-trip pre briefings that introduce U.S.-Japan relations, a week-long trip to Tokyo to meet with Japanese policymakers and experts, and a post-trip post -trip opportunities for publication and networking. In 2014, Sasakawa USA partnered with the Center for American Pro Progress, which is a progressive think tank. And from the Center for American Progress, uh, there were eight emerging security and defense experts that were chosen. In 2015, Sasakawa USA partnered with Foreign Policy uh, Initiative, which is a conservative think tank, to also bring eight uh, security and defense experts. The Seed Plus program, which you see here today, invited previous Seed participants from these two trips uh, to meet with new experts uh, and, and to form a new group where two, two individuals from the Center for American Progress and, uh, trip and two individuals from, from the Foreign Policy Initiative trip and additional two were, were brought together for six uh, six-person delegation. Since yesterday, we've been engaged in many meetings. We've met with Diet members. We've met with self-defense force officers. We've met with top officials in the Conte, security and defense scholars and policy experts to go over a wide ranging uh, set of discussions looking not just at domestic issues in both our countries, but also foreign policy challenges and security challenges in the Asia Pacific region, as well as around the world, and what role the US, Japan, and the alliance can and should play. This public forum that we have here today caps off our trip. And so to begin with our first panel, uh, we will be talking about US global leadership and foreign policy. And to lead us in this discussion, we have three outstanding uh, individuals. Sam Brennan, who's Senior Manager for Global Business Policy Council at AT Kearney. Brian Harding, who's the Director for East and Southeast Asia, the Center for American Progress. And Philip Lohaus, who's a Research Fellow, Maryland Ware Center for Security Studies, American Enterprise Institute. So with that, Sam, let me begin with you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and thank you to Sasakawa USA and Sasakawa Peace Foundation. It's a pleasure to have been on the trip and to have met with so many uh, great thinkers uh, about the same issues that we follow in Washington, but in particular from the U.S.-Japan uh, dimension. I've been asked today to provide an overview of the Obama administration's policy since January of 2009, and I think just by naming the events that have happened during this administration, it becomes clear that this is a time of great change in the world. Asia is part of that, but there are many other issues and regions that compete for U.S. policymakers' attention. When the Obama administration entered office in 2009, <coughs> the immediate priority was economic, and it was restoring the global economy and first the U.S. economy. Uh, so foreign policy really was an important issue, but it was a secondary issue to uh, restoring economic growth. The Obama administration succeeded uh, to some degree. The U.S. economy is now a bright spot among major advanced economies. It will grow at approximately 2.4 percent GDP this year. The next challenge from the first day in office for the Obama administration was the principal change that happened after the attacks of 9-11 in 2001, and that is the threat of global terrorism. This is a challenge that I believe has taken more time of senior policymakers than any other, and it's related to a number of issues that we'll cover subsequently, but first is the issue of Afghanistan and Pakistan, where the Obama administration entered office with a priority to shift its focus from the war in Iraq to the war ongoing in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, where U.S. forces uh, continue to be engaged even today. 
The Obama administration has succeeded in its counterterrorism efforts in preventing another major attack uh, on U.S. soil, arguably. Uh, the challenge has been uh, what we call lone wolf attackers from San Bernardino to the Fort Hood shooting, a number of large-scale terrorism incidents that are almost impossible to detect uh, have, have occurred during the Obama administration. Uh, but these are principally law enforcement issues. They are not defense policy issues, uh, but still remain a major uh, challenge that will continue through the next administration. During the, the events of, of, uh, of, of U.S. Uh, uh, reconsideration of its role in Iraq, uh, it proved impossible to reach an agreement with the Iraqi government for U.S. forces to remain in Iraq. It's a very important distinction that the U.S. did not withdraw from Iraq uh, without consulting the Iraqi government. It withdrew at the request of the Iraqi government. This has turned out to be a major mistake for the people of Iraq and led to the return of terrorism uh, and violence between the people of Iraq and many of its neighbors. Uh, this, this is uh, linked to the so-called uh, Islamic State, ISIS, which is now a global terrorism threat, but that arose out of groups within Iraq uh, that were able to exploit uh, the next issue that I'll discuss, which is the events of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring very quickly took uh, the attention of the Obama administration when in Tunisia there was a sudden revolution that touched off uh, events in Egypt, in Syria, in Libya, and across the Arab world, to which the Obama administration and the rest of the world needed very suddenly to respond. It was very unexpected. Uh, and unfortunately, in many of the cases, uh, the uh, change and progress and democratization that had been hoped for in the Arab <coughs> Spring uh, remains unachieved. Uh, and there are difficulties in all of the countries in which the Arab Spring occurred, and in particular in Syria, uh, which is, I believe, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the great failure of the Obama administration uh, in, in not acting, and the rest of the world community, who's looked on as Syria has fallen apart and spread chaos in the rest of the region, including Iraq, including threatening other close allies in the region, Jordan, Turkey. <coughs> While all of this was going on, the Obama administration did enunciate a new and very important strategy, which was the concept of rebalancing resources and attention to Asia. And Brian will discuss this, so I won't cover it. He's far more qualified than I am to, to speak about this. Um, there have also been major signature achievements in the Obama administration that have included a nuclear deal with Iran that the administration believes uh, has successfully prevented the need for a war in the Middle East that would have uh, struck at Iran's nuclear facilities, whether by the U.S. or another country in the region conducting that war. Uh, it's to be determined where that relationship will go in the future, uh, but it, it, is, it is clear <coughs> that for the time being, relations have improved with Iran, uh, and there is an opening, a political opening in particular within Iran for the Iranian people to choose a more productive, constructive relationship with the outside world and with the United States. Only time will tell whether this has been uh, a good decision and how successful it will be over the long term, uh, but certainly the previous Iran policy was not sustainable, and the consequence of not reaching a deal, I believe, would have been war in the Middle East between Iran and many others in the region. Of course, there were many other events that happened that took uh, the time and attention of the Obama administration, uh, some of them uh, very familiar to you, uh, Operation Tomodachi, domestically responding to Hurricane Sandy, responding to the Ebola virus, responding to the Zika virus most recently, uh, responding to issues uh, that have uh, been unexpected, such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. So overall, this has been a very challenging time for the United States, uh, and it's been a very unexpected series of events for the Obama administration. Uh, I would expect whoever is the next president uh, will very much be living with the consequences of many of these events, just as the Obama administration inherited two very large-scale wars and a global campaign against terrorism that continues to today. And of course, we should expect many surprises as well. 
So that's just a, a very quick tour of all of the things that happened uh, over the past seven years. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see the president and his team have been very busy. Thank you, Sam. Brian? Thank you, Jeffrey. I was asked to speak about uh, um, Asia policy and the U.S. rebalance to Asia under President Obama and some uh, uh, possibilities for change or continuity. But first, just a, just a quick observation on the juncture of U.S. politics and Asia policy. I just must say that as an Asia specialist, it's been extraordinary to see Asia become a major uh, presidential election issue. Uh, this is not something we typically expect uh, in the United States. Uh, in past election cycles, Japanese friends and others from around the region have said, why are uh, these critical issues of U.S.-Japan alliance not in the campaign cycle? And I say, you don't want them to be uh, part of the presidential election campaign because nothing good can come of that, and I think that has been the case. Uh, we typically think that Asia policy is one small area in Washington uh, where there's bipartisan agreement. Uh, and I'm happy to report that despite it uh, becoming a presidential election issue, among the foreign policy establishment, it remains uh, a generally bipartisan affair. Um, the bad news is that um, uh, it has come up in the context of the presidential campaign uh, from Donald Trump and about the perceived problems that come from Asia, not the opportunities. Uh, and a lot of this has to do uh, with perceptions about free trade, which is another challenge for U.S. policy in Asia moving forward that the United States does not have a uh, consensus on free trade at the moment. I'm happy to talk about more of that in the question and answer. But thinking about Asia policy under the Obama administration, uh, I'm typically asked to speak about whether the so-called rebalance or pivot to Asia was successful. I think it's important to remember what the rebalance was in the first place. It was the idea that uh, a simple uh, analytical conclusion by President Obama and his team that the history of the 21st century would be written in Asia, that we had a lot of problems in the Middle East and Southwest Asia, and we had a whole lot of opportunities and long-term challenges in East Asia that needed more focus. Based on Sam's presentation and the list of issues that have occupied the attention of the Obama administration, I would not say that the rebalance has been successful. We have not rebalanced the time and attention of the senior leaders of our country on Asia. That said, if we take away this uh, loaded word, uh, rebalance or pivot, I think Asia, Asia policy has been quite successful. Um, politically, when I look around the region, I see bilateral relations uh, uh, stronger than they were seven or eight years ago with almost every single country. I think the U.S.-Japan alliance is stronger than ever with the new defense guidelines. If we can finish the TPP, we essentially have a U.S.-Japan free trade agreement. That's remarkable. We have a stronger U.S.-South Korea alliance, a uh, stronger U.S.-Philippines uh, alliance, a brand new relationship with Myanmar, more developed ties with Indonesia, uh, and, and the list goes on. We're also deeply involved in the multilateral forums in Asia. While uh, uh, past administrations had uh, uh, panned uh, regional institutions, such as the ASEAN Regional Forum and the East Asia Summit, simply as talk shops, the Obama administration has engaged with these vigorously. I think there's a lot of work to do to improve these institutions so they can actually solve problems. But the United States has a seat at the table now. On defense, I think, uh, I think we all would have liked to see more uh, investments, but in the context of a declining resource environment, Asia has been protected uh, and in some cases plussed up. In particular, we've made strides on uh, having a more uh, uh, adapted uh, force, U.S. force posture in the region. Economically, I think this has been the weak part of Asia policy, uh, and a bit of that still to be determined. Uh, certainly the big piece of, uh, of business left to go is whether we can ratify the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, uh, and if we can do that, I think we can at least claim some success, although the United States structurally has a lot more to do to figure out how to uh, engage economically in the region. On the question of continuity or change, I think ultimately this depends on who is elected. Um, if it is Secretary Clinton, I think you will have more continuity and change in U.S. policy in the Asia Pacific. Um, Secretary Clinton, uh, uh, as we all remember, she made her first trip as Secretary of State to Asia. She's the first and over fifth, first Secretary of State since Dean Rusk uh, over 50 years ago to make the first trip to Asia. And her first stop was here in Japan. Uh, and I, I can't imagine somebody, uh, uh, a better way to demonstrate about how she looks at Asia 
uh, than making Japan the first stop as Secretary of State. And that, frankly, has everything to do with the people, the top people who are advising Secretary Clinton. Uh, there is an abundance of Asia expertise, U.S.-Japan experience um, in that group, and I think uh, uh, um, her policy will reflect that. She's also the secretary who really uh, broke the ice in uh, raising difficult issues such as the South China Sea and multilateral forums. It was the ASEAN Regional Forum in Hanoi in 2010 that really uh, uh, started, uh, really raised this issue above, above the surface. And she's not, um, while uh, you know, she is interested in having a, uh, uh, as comprehensive a relationship uh, with China where we can cooperate when possible, she sees China with eyes wide open uh, and is uh, not shy to say so. But the reality is, in terms of continuity or change, even though Secretary Clinton understands that uh, the future of the 21st century is going to be written right here in Asia, she's going to continue to be pulled towards other regions of the world, in particular the Middle East. There's just no other way about it, as Sam mentioned, that even if one's uh, head tells you that long-term strategy needs to include Asia at front and, uh, front and center, the Middle East, for the foreseeable future, is going to consume an incredible amount of time and part of the present. Of course, so that's the continuity side. And uh, in terms of change, um, uh, that really leads us to Mr. Trump. And I don't think we really know exactly what uh, uh, Trump policy in Asia would be. I think there's a worst case scenario where, uh, where he might look to, quote, make a deal with China uh, to uh, uh, put, you know, it really create this uh, uh, situation where China uh, can, can somehow take uh, leadership in this part of the world and the United States will be detached. I think the, possibly the more, likely po the more likely possibility and the better possibility would be that uh, he's going to be so worried about building a wall and other issues at home and losing political capital that, that he might forget about these wild promises uh, regarding the U.S.-Japan alliance and other alliances around the world. Thank you, um, and uh, I have the distinct challenge of going last and um, wrapping everything, um, in including a response to the previous two panelists, into my comments. Um, so I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, when I was invited to come on this trip, I was asked to speak about a project that I work on, or at least the themes of the project that I work on, called the American Internationalism Project. And um, strangely, uh, this project started three years ago, um, but the lessons that we've learned are as applicable today as they uh, were when we first started the project. Um, the project was started in uh, 2013 when, um, at the time, uh, Senator Rand Paul was talking about a need to pull back out of world affairs. Um, this was deeply concerning um, on a bipartisan basis to um, former members of Congress, also former um, uh, officials within the government, um, because it went against the instincts that we all, um, and I think I also speak for my, co my panelists um, up here as well, know to be true that America is a better place, or I'm sorry, the world is a better place when America takes the leadership role that the world expects that it should take. Um, at the time, it was viewed as a reaction to what some perceived to be um, the overreach of the Bush administration. Um, but also, there were some other things driving us in the background, pressing domestic issues at home, so to speak. Um, some related to the financial crisis, and some were more systematic. Um, but this led to a growing, what we observed was that there was a growing sense among the American public and um, a reaction to them in the political class that uh, the costs of international leadership, to include um, security leadership, leadership in the economic realm, leadership in human rights and disaster relief and things like that, were no longer worth, uh, the benefits were no longer outweighing the costs of that activity. And of course, we all thought that that really wasn't the case. Um, but uh, the more we dug into this, it was interesting to look at the statistics. Um, in 2013, it was actually the first time um, in the survey's history and it had gone back 30 to 40 years, um, talking, I believe it was from the uh, Pew Council, talking about um, what Americans think of America's role in the world. And um, for the first time, there was a majority that said that America should mind its own business when it comes to global <coughs> affairs. And this was uh, deeply concerning to all of us. Now, fast forward three years, um, we're facing somebody that's um, much more bombastic, much more... Um, <coughs> a much larger threat, in a way, to America's leadership role in world affairs than Senator Paul ever was. Um, and that, of course, is Donald Trump. 
Um, and I'm, I'll speak about him in a moment, but I would like to highlight the fact that um, the dynamics that are driving uh, people like Trump to actually be able to achieve the authority they're achieving within the American political system are not unique to the Republican Party. Um, we haven't talked much about Bernie Sanders' foreign policy, perhaps for two reasons. First of all, it's much less likely that he's going to get the nomination. In fact, I think it's fair to say it's almost impossible that he'd get the Democratic nomination, but also because he hasn't really talked much about foreign affairs. Um, Trump, on the other hand, has, and what he said has been concerning. Um, so this is a bipartisan delegation, and those of us here who were Republicans have all signed on to a letter um, talking about how we don't approve of what Donald Trump has said and how um, the things that he said we believe would be very damaging to not only America's role in the world generally, but also to um, our alliances, to include the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, and in terms of continuity or change, um, I would actually say that uh, when it comes to, to Clinton, um, we may actually get some change. Um, Clinton may actually be a little bit more willing to be um, engaged and forward-leaning. Um, there, If you look at Secretary Clinton's past statements before she was running for office and arguably pulled to the left by Bernie Sanders, um, you know there are many people who view her as having a much more assertive uh, foreign policy than the current administration does. Um, but when it comes to Trump, um, I don't know if we would get change. I think it's a really, it's a wild card. It's a total unknown. Um, his policies are very erratic. They're very contradictory if you look at them closely. And for the most part, I would argue that they are driven by a reaction to a sense in the American public that we were studying in my project um, that the system in America is not actually uh, helping everybody out, that it's only helping out the elites. Um, and I think that you know we can get into a discussion of why that's the case um, in the question and answer period. Um, but these are challenges that the next um, administration, whether it's a Trump administration or a Clinton administration, will need to be aware of and will need to address if they want to uh, maintain America's role in the world. I should also mention that there are real constraints um, because I know that Trump is probably on many people's mind here. Um, it's important to re re reiterate that even if he were to be elected, there are important constraints on, um, I guess, the damage he could do. <laughs> um, for example, um, in Congress, something that he said is talking about um, the administration, talking about how he would undo alliances and undo treaties. Um, well, you know, Congress actually has to ratify that. And I think with the way the trends are going right now, it would be unlikely that Congress uh, is, Congress may not stay um, in Republican control, certainly not in the Senate, which has responsibility for ratifying treaties. There have also been many senior military officials and former um, intelligence officials that have said if Donald Trump follows through on some of his outlandish ideas, um, they actually would not obey orders. And that remains to be seen if that would occur, but I can't recall any time in my lifetime that that's been the case. So really briefly, because I know I don't have too much more time, um, to comment on um, Obama's Asia policy. Um, it was laid out really well. Um, I don't share all of the, um, all of the views that my co-panelists do, um, but one area that I do think is positive is President Obama's vi upcoming visit to Hiroshima. Um, the knee-jerk reaction of a lot of people was that, oh, his apology tour continues. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I think it's um, extremely important for uh, the Japan-U.S. <laughs> alliance for a president to come and visit such uh, an important and historical site. I also think that the rebalance in principle was, interest, was important, but that it hasn't actually played out um, how the administration thought. Um, and I would just, uh, I would just point out the fact that you know the fact that the American Navy is smallest since World War One and its army is the smallest since World War Two, sends a really important signal to the region, um, even if uh, the rhetoric uh, would suggest otherwise. Um, so I have some lessons learned that I could talk about. I'll only cover a couple, um, but in general, with the administration and this applies to both its Asia policy and its larger policy in the world. Um, I think the next president could learn from this administration the importance of linking ends, ways, and means. Um, and just briefly, ISIS, um, you know, the administration has said that it wants to um, destroy or decimate or um, degrade ISIS, but it's not necessarily matching the tools that America has at its disposal to actually accomplishing those ends. And I'm not saying that, that ISIS, that ends uh, to which he's trying to destroy ISIS are right or that that end is right. But um, if that is the end, then we need to match resources. And I think you could draw that analogy out in other regions as well. And then the last lesson is that um, American leadership still matters. Um, from this trip and others that I've taken in the region, it's very clear that our allies um, look to America for the framework that has been established since World War II. And uh, that 
we could do a better job as foreign policy experts, and I think we'd all agree, communicating the importance of that to the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Before I turn it over to you, the audience, to ask questions, I'm going to ask one question of the panelists, give you a little time to think uh, of your questions. Um, and the question is this. Uh, all of you laid out um, a number of issues that the Obama administration has been grappling with, be it Iran, ISIS, Russia, Asian rebalance, uh, China. Uh, and there's, you can debate whether it's been, whether there's been successes or failures, but looking ahead, regardless of whether we have a Trump presidency or a Clinton presidency, uh, with all the issues that you've, you've dealt with in terms of, or you've spoken about for US foreign policy, what would you recommend that the next president should do differently uh, regarding any of these issues. There's a whole bunch of things out there, but if, if you had the ear of the next president, what should the next president do differently? And I'll ask each of you in turn, but whoever wants to go first. I, let me just, I think uh, one well-reported problem in the, uh, in this, this is uh, slightly, that doesn't quite answer your question, but it, but it certainly re relates, uh, is making sure that the policy-making process works better. I think some of our greatest, quote, failures of Asia policy have really been failures of the policy process. And case in point has been, was just how long it took for the United States to do freedom of navigation operations uh, around artificial islands in the South China Sea. I think we got the policy right, but it took us way too long. And it had everything to do with a national security decision-making process that doesn't make decisions. I think we also saw this uh, in the U.S. Uh, response to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I think we might have wound up with the right po the policy, but the, the decision making within the administration did not work effectively, and in the end, we looked clumsy. So I think there, there are certain areas for particular uh, uh, improvement uh, and change in foreign policy, but if we don't get the decision making processes right, um, then, then there's not much hope anyway. Thank you. Philip? Um, I would actually agree with that point, that process is key. Um, and this administration process is notoriously run directly out of the White House with a very powerful National Security Council. And so just to key off of that, that's one recommendation I would make to the next president, that, that they should relook that structure and perhaps empower each of the individual agencies further. Um, but one, the, one, the, the issue I want to talk about was China, because I'm sure it's on everybody's mind. Um, I, uh, we've had some interesting discussions about the extent to which um, China, we've been able to fold China into the international system. And um, I would actually argue that we've actually really tried to do that over the past 40 years. Um, and we've done it largely successfully. Um, but what I am more concerned about is the fact that um, we haven't actually, we haven't come up with uh, sufficient or effective costs to essentially, I don't want to say punish, but to uh, deter China from taking actions, um, be it in the South China Sea, be it in the cyber realm, be it um, anywhere in the gray zone, things like that. Um, so I think we need to come up with a better, with better tools to be able to do that. Um, so not only focusing on engaging because China's not going away anytime soon, but also focusing on the costs that will occur if, um, if, if China takes certain actions. And of course, we need to define what those lines are as well. But um, we need to come up with better mechanisms, and I think that's actually a fruitful opportunity for um, allied, allied cooperation. Thank you, Philip. Sam? Just, just to add, um, I, I think continuing to uh, rely on allies and make allies part of the planning process in an even closer way. I think with the range of challenges that are on the horizon, it's impossible for the United States to succeed without allies playing a bigger role. The temptation in Washington is often just to ask allies for money or ask them for a specific kind of military force, but it has to go much deeper than that. It has to be <coughs> shared strategy and, and vision. And I think in many cases, uh, what's happened in the Middle East has been that the United States has relied on either the wrong allies and partners, uh, has over relied on single allies and partners uh, with unrealistic expectations, uh, or has simply failed in its own uh, response to the crisis to take the time to think about what role uh, different allies and partners sh should take. So high, high expectations of allies and partners, but uh, more, more strategic, which goes to the, the policy planning process. Okay, let's go right into the next panel. 
The next panel will be focusing on U.S. defense requirements, capabilities, and cooperation with allies and partners. And for this discussion, we have another uh, great panel. Uh, we have David at Adesnik, who's the pol policy director at Foreign Policy Initiative. Melissa Dalton, who's a fellow and chief of staff at, for the International Security Program at CSIS, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Rach and Rachel Hoff, who's the director of defense analysis at the American Action Forum. So David, I'll start with you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jeff, and really thank you to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and to Sasakawa USA for making this all possible. Uh, I'd like to say this is my first trip ever to Japan, and, and it's really been a wonderful time, and everyone has been so welcoming. So let me address really one fundamental question, which is what role do alliances play in American strategy and American national security? Not any particular alliance, not NATO or not the alliance with Japan, but what is the role of alliances altogether? Um, Donald Trump has challenged our fundamental understanding uh, of alliances. He has challenged the need for them. He has called NATO obsolete, and he has said that perhaps we are losing out in our alliances with Japan and Korea. Um, I heartily disagree with these sentiments, but it's extremely important to understand the way they are anchored in the conflicted attitudes that Americans have toward alliances and have had across their history. We have to go back to things that we have forgotten, that we have taken for granted, and ask those questions again. So what is that role? And I think in one line, it would say alliances are part of a forward deterrence strategy, that we have alliances in Asia, in Europe, and in the Middle East to prevent conflict, and especially to prevent aggression by hostile powers, and to achieve a measure of stability and peace. And in that space of peace, we can focus on prosperity and freedom. Now, this conclusion is a reversal of a traditional position that the United States had before World War II. That as we took it, the lesson of the 1930s was that isolationism could not succeed, that our effort to distance ourselves from potential allies was the problem, that because of the size of the United States and its potential power and wealth, when major conflicts began in Europe and in Asia, there was no way to stay distant from them. So the answer then, after the war, was to set up a system of alliances in both Europe and Asia, and later in the Middle East, that would enable us to prevent those kind of conflicts from emerging and becoming so large. So in other words, it's a preventive approach. It's one that deters conflict, and it deters it forward on the far side of either ocean, that we've realized the oceans are not necessarily a defense, because if the wars begin on the far side, they can come across. Now, there are persistent tensions in every alliance. There is always a tension about burden sharing, how much should each side contribute. But I want to look at the even deeper questions about should we have alliances at all. And it's important to look at the roots of the anti-alliance and anti-interventionist tradition in American history. And the, the most important statement of that view is from the farewell address of George Washington, our first president in 1796, that even to this day we regard his advice as among the most sage advice, there is almost universal admiration for his achievements. And when he says something, it has tremendous weight. And I just want to quote briefly from this farewell address when he said, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances. That is just one line. And for those who are against alliances, that is a line that stands out on its own. And it is invoked, and it had to be broken with in order for us to establish NATO and establish alliances in East Asia. There's a question, what, what was he saying at the time? What is its application for today? Now, if we read the, uh, a slightly longer quote, we get a little more of a sense of what the challenge was. He said, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. So far, I mean as we are now at liberty to do it. For let, us, let me not be understood as capable of patronizing infidelity to existing arrangements. That is some very antiquated English. It can be hard to understand. His basic message is um, we should be free of alliances only to the extent that we can. It's a conditional statement. And this does not mean I want to betray existing alliances. So again, he has very important reservations about what he's saying. And there was actually quite a measure of spin that we take Washington as the most important uh, speaker of truth. But he was really saying that he was against an alliance with France and for a relationship with Britain that was close to having an alliance. And it's when we understand these kind of statements in context that we have to look at the world around us. This was 
not an absolute statement from the foremost founder of our country that we should oppose alliances, but just because he wasn't saying that, it means we still have to make an affirmative case. We have to go back and ask if the lessons we learned as a result of World War II still apply today, is it the case that we need alliances to play the role of forward deterrence? Uh, I believe we do, uh, but I'd say the countervailing view is sometimes called offshore balancing. It's the idea that if we are too aggressive in having these alliances, in doing too much for others, they will not do things for themselves. I think it's extremely welcome that Japan has done so much recently with its new legislation to show that it will take a proactive role. But Americans are still very deeply rooted in this view that they don't want to do too much for other people. They want people to show that they're taking care of their own responsibilities. But I think we also see the problem is if we don't step in and set an example of leadership, the right things don't happen. In an ideal world, if we step back, others would lean in, as the saying goes in the United States today, and take more responsibility for themselves. However, I think what we have seen is somewhat in the Middle East an experiment in what happens when the United States steps back and lets others fill in the gaps. And I think what we have seen is there becomes a lot of fear that no one has comparable power, no one has uh, the same resources that we have, no one can step in and play a coordinating role in bringing others together, and this can lead to chaos and to extensive violence. And I hope we can make this case, but the, my point I really want to make is that we are going to have to go back to first principles, that Donald Trump, in what he says, is challenging the assumption, the fact that we take for granted the importance of alliances, and we're going to have to go back and understand our history and understand why for 150 years alliances were really not a key part of American foreign policy. We're going to have to learn the lessons of World War II again, and people are going to have to have an informed debate and make a decision. There has to be popular support for alliances to continue, because the relationship of public opinion to government uh, decisions is indirect, but ultimately it is a very powerful factor and we cannot ignore it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Melissa? Thanks very much. And I just want to echo the thanks to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation as well as <coughs> Sasakawa USA uh, for the opportunity to, to be with you all today and for the terrific meetings that, that we've had this week. Um, David gave you a, a great historical and political framework for the importance of alliances in U.S. strategy. I would like to take some time to dive a bit deeper um, specifically on U.S. defense capabilities and defense cooperation um, with allies and partners in the Asia Pacific um, and also some specific uh, statements and recommendations about the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance. With uncertainty over China's trajectory, the United States and Japan must develop a resilient strategy and capabilities to deal with a number of possible futures. Currently, there is no clear strategy for managing China's rise or for countering its coercive activities. China's tolerance for risk has exceeded expectations, evidenced by its increased military operations and its construction of military airfields and facilities in the surrounding islands. The anti-axis area denial threat is increasing. Without major breakthroughs in technology and capabilities by the United States and its allies and partners, substantial risk remains that the Chinese military strategy could undermine the U.S. ability to protect its interests in the Asia Pacific. I'd like to offer some specific recommendations regarding U.S. capabilities and the role of allies and partners to help mitigate this risk. I'll start with the role of allies and partners. Strengthening capacity, capability, resiliency, and interoperability among allies and partners in the Asia Pacific requires a differentiated approach to work with highly capable militaries like Japan, as well as Australia, India, South Korea, and Singapore, while assisting states in Southeast Asia. Focusing on developing and sharing capabilities and capacity to knit together the United States and its key allies and partners could include training and logistical support, concept development, and potentially some operational missions that the United States and Japan, along with Australia, South Korea, uh, could, could work together um, and draw them closer together. Bringing together expertise in design and operations could increase both capability and interoperability in the areas of missile defense, undersea warfare, maritime domain awareness, cyber, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, amphibious operations, and in intelligence sharing. Secondly, the United States, Japan, Australia, India, and South Korea should harmonize their capacity building efforts in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian partners' greatest shortfall is in maritime security. Smaller states 
lack sensors and patrol craft to monitor maritime areas that are critical for the region. Engagement, this will require engagement outside of traditional military channels. Not all need, needs may be met through typical military assistance. It'll require working with Coast Guards, working with law enforcement, working with intelligence. Third, the United States and its allies should seek to strengthen regional command and control and exercises through the cre creation of a joint task force for the Western Pacific with a focus on maritime security. Task forces are usually set up in times of conflict, but arrangements like this actually work best with pre-existing arrangements and are exercised on a regular basis with regional allies and partners to include military representatives from J Japan and, and other allies. Japan should also consider creating a joint operations command. The current alliance coordination mechanism that was established last year lacks the command and control elements needed for rapid, joint, and combined response to crises separate from chief of defense functions. The US, United States could provide personnel to be integrated into this command if deemed appropriate by the Japanese. Fourth, the United States and its allies should deepen their humanitarian assistance and disaster relief expertise. The Asia Pacific region sits on the ring of fire and faces the world's highest risk of natural disaster and possesses the most geographically concentrated population on Earth. Increasing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief requires greater interoperability with non-military and military arms of government, and they must exercise regularly together to create institutional connections and individuals' trust before a crisis occurs. The second priority I'd like to focus on today is sustaining and expanding U.S. military presence in the region, which is absolutely critical given the, the threats at hand. The United States and Japan must pursue base realignment. The political dynamics remain significant, but moving forward with the Fatenma replacement facility remains the best option for the United States and Japan. The United States should continue developing access agreements throughout Asia beyond Japan to ensure the ability to maneuver in times of crisis. The United States should seek to improve its undersea capacity. This represents the greatest combat edge that the United States has um, in the undersea domain. Forward stationing additional submarines in the region, perhaps in Guam, perhaps more broadly in the Indian Ocean area, um, would require additional infrastructure improvements. But again, this is the greatest asymmetric edge that the United States possesses and, and we need to deepen our investments in that area. The United States should also seek to deploy additional amphibious and lift capacity for the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, missions and exercises in order to be able to respond effectively to crisis. And it should continue diversifying its air operating locations to mitigate risks to attack. Clustering some bases in the region could help ease some of the logistical burden um, than, rather than having to resupply bases that are spread across the vast expanse of the Pacific. The United States should seek to bolster regional missile defense to include integrated air and missile defense with Japan and South Korea and increase its own missile inventory given the potential threat of a high number of cruise and ballistic missiles that could occur in a conflict. The United States should also advance and adapt it's the Army's regionally aligned forces concept employing smaller units to sustain mission requirements in the region. It should also address logistics challenges, stockpiling critical munitions uh, that would be vital in, in a potential conflict. It should work with allies and partners to increase intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance coverage and look to actually co-produce ISR platforms with allies conducting combined operations and analysis of ISR missions, particularly in the South China Sea and East China Sea. It should also accelerate development of innovative capabilities and concept. This entails ins institutionalizing a culture of experimentation, wargaming, encouraging rapid platform evolution, and developing advanced systems to penetrate anti-access and area denial capabilities. These are just among some of the capabilities that the United States should be investing in going forward to mention a couple of other cyber, space, and electronic warfare that I'm happy to get into in the question and answer period. Um, and while these capabilities will help close the anti-access area denial gap, 
the tools for dealing with Chinese broader coercive activities will require a range of tools beyond the military toolkit to include economic, diplomatic, cyber information, law enforcement uh, approaches as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Rachel? Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, my role today and, and, and what I've been asked to talk about is um, whether or not the United States has the resources available to meet the national security threats that we've been talking about to implement the kind of, of capabilities and strategies um, when it comes to both regional threats as well as global threats. There's a saying in the United States that all politics is local. And so for my comments today, I'm going to revise that to say that perhaps all foreign policy is domestic. The conversations that we've been having about, about security threats, um, about geopolitical strategy, about the importance of the US-Japan alliance are all subject to domestic political constraints within the United States and of course um, here in Japan as well. Essentially, this conversation is irrelevant if, um, if it's not supported both um, in terms of adequate resourcing and um, public opinion or political will. So today I'm going to discuss both U.S. fiscal resources and then turn to an assessment of, of to my assessment of American public opinion when it, when it comes to these issues. There will be some, some bad news and some good news. So despite um, some of the, the foreign policy progress that, that we've discussed here today, it's, it's important to remember that particularly in the last five years, there have been significant national security threats that have emerged um, around the world from the deterioration of the Middle East, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and annexation of Crimea, and of course, Chinese, rising Chinese aggression here in the Asia Pacific. Perhaps most striking is that during this same five-year period when global instability has risen, the United States has cut its defense budget by 25% in real dollars. In 2011, uh, five years ago, political leaders in Washington passed the Budget Control Act. It was intended to reduce the deficit in the U.S. budget uh, in response to the uh, looming debt ceiling. Perhaps, um, well, although that was the intent, Congress failed to pass a deficit reduction proposal, and when that happened, it triggered a one-time across-the-board sequestration cut to the U.S. budget, uh, as well as 10 successive years of caps on both domestic and defense spending. The great irony of the so-called Budget Control Act is that it failed to actually control the part of the budget that is really the problem, uh, which is mandatory spending, uh, entitlement spending on programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. These are the programs that have skyrocketed uh, within the U.S. budget in the, last, um, in the last decades and are the source of, of America's great budget problems. Um, instead, the Budget Control Act focused on discretionary spending rather than mandatory spending, and it pitted defense spending against domestic spending. And what has resulted is a political reality where we cannot raise defense spending without uh, an equal dollar-for-dollar dollar increase in domestic spending. Meanwhile, conversations about actually fixing the fundamental budget problems in America have been sidelined. Um, and so while Republicans may want to tackle entitlement reform as a way to fix our, our big budget problems, and, and Democrats may want to increase revenue or, or raise taxes as a way to, um, to solve our, our budget problems, both of those are essentially off the table during what some call the sequestration window, these 10 years where these budget caps on both domestic and defense spending are in place. Um, of course, this has real impact on our ability to implement the kind of strategies that we've been talking about, to develop the capabilities that we've been talking about, um, and it presents a very troubling signal to both our allies around the world and to our adversaries. It's important to remember that sequestration and the spending caps were never intended to be policy. 
they were a political threat. Um, and the fact that they have been implemented represents a real political failure on the part of, of uh, the U.S. government. Um, sequestration and, and the budget caps were not a policy that, that was intended to rein in spending in any kind of concerted way. And more to the point for our conversation today, they, are not, um, they were not crafted in a way that was meant to meet the rising national security threats um, uh, in, a, in a strategic way. So there's some bad news on the resource front. Um, there's some good news on the side of a different kind of resource, which is American political will and public opinion. There's broad bipartisan agreement among uh, defense leaders in Washington and also among the American public uh, that, in that defense spending needs to be increased. Um, in order to reverse the cuts of sequestration and, uh, and the resulting spending caps. I think it's important that um, in, an, in a presidential cycle where we've witnessed, as we talked about in the previous panel, some gaps between the American political elite and the American public, this is one where the American public uh, and the political e elite and also the candidates on both sides of the aisle seem to have some agreement. Um, Secretary Clinton has long been critical of sequestration and cuts to the defense budget. Donald Trump, in his recent foreign policy address, um, for what it's worth, stated very clearly, uh, he said that we'll spend whatever it takes to rebuild the American military, saying, quote, it is the cheapest single investment we can make, end quote, implying that he has, um, that he's expressing a commitment to um, to rebuilding the military as a way to um, spend money now that allows us to save money later so that wh when those national security threats might, might come to fruition in a way that's damaging both to American national security and, and the security of our allies. So although we have a real resource problem in terms of the, secu the security strategies we've been discussing, I'm hopeful that the next American president um, may be able to muster both the budgetary resources and the political will, uh, demonstrate leadership to support the necessary national security aims that, that we've been discussing today. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So once again, before I turn, uh, open the floor for you to ask questions, I'm going to uh, take advantage of my position as moderator and ask a question to the, the panelists. We heard a lot here about, um, if I could sum it up in one word, we heard alliances, capabilities, and resources. Um, one thing I want to ask has to do with, uh, I guess cooperation would be the way to put it. When you look at the level of cooperation that this administration uh, has, has pursued with uh, bilateral, uh, trilateral, multilateral, uh, various partnerships, um, Looking at those, thinking of those, and, and I guess in your mind critiquing those, which relation, which, which bilat, trilat, multilat, do you think that the next administration should give, the most, give more attention to? Maybe it hasn't gotten enough attention uh, in this administration. When, when you look at the U.S. Uh, defense policies or, or foreign policy, which relationship should the U.S. give more attention to in the next administration? I'd like all your thoughts on that. So, um, any, Rachel, do you want to start? Or? Uh, I or, certainly can. Well, um, I think, I mean, the easy answer here today is Japan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I would say is, is perhaps a little bit more broad but inclusive of Japan, that our strongest allies have, uh, as a result of recent of decisions, um, I, I would argue, in the current U.S. administration, come to doubt American credibility, um, American friendship, um, America's ability to fulfill to fulfill its its security commitments, and, and I would say that this is this is true in different parts of the world, uh, not the least of which is is here in the Asia Pacific, and so um, we have a lot of complicated or, or more nuanced alliances around the world. Um, Japan is a fairly straightforward alliance, and I think that um, greater attention just to, well, 
because it is a straightforward alliance, sometimes maybe there's a, a tendency to think that it's therefore easy and maybe doesn't need as much attention as, as other alliances. Um, and, and perhaps this administration has also gone out of its way to, to um, exert or to lend a hand of, um, of friendship toward, toward some traditional adversaries around the world. Um, and maybe what has come at the expense of that um, is those or are those fundamental easy alliances. And, and um, just because this is not our most complicated alliance does not mean that it's one that, that is any less deserving of, of American attention uh, and care. And so, so I, would, I would kind of put Japan in, in the category with, um, with our, our strongest allies around the world that deserve significant American attention. Great. Um, th thanks for the question. I mean, I, I think that we have a bedrock of very strong bilateral alliances. Um, we've been working towards strengthening trilateral engagements as well as multilateral engagements, um, not just in the Asia Pacific, but more broadly. Where I would like to see the United States going forward is, is weaving together a network of those alliances and partnerships that um, certainly are important in the specific region in which they reside, but also span globally, given the transnational cross-functional threats that the United States uh, faces going forward. Um, you know, they're, the challenge of, of China, the challenge of Russia, um, you know, are, are certainly very challenging in their own domains, in their own areas of the world, but um, their areas or spheres of influence arguably are global. Um, transnational threats, by definition, are transnational, transregional. Cyber um, spans globally. Um, and so building a network of allies and partners that can work together, leverage comparative advantages to bring to bear against those challenges, I think is the next step um, for alliance and partnerships going forward. Um, just to add very briefly, um, I don't believe that this administration has neglected any particular groups. It's that there are profound disagreements between the administration and its critics about how it should be approaching these groups. Um, I mean, foremost, there's no question that the quality of the U.S. relationship with Israel, one of its key allies in the Middle East, has deteriorated sharply. And of course, there's finger pointing from in either direction about whose fault that is. More broadly in the Middle East, there is a sense that um, the United States, in its effort to secure a nuclear deal with Iran, may have uh, tilted too much toward Iran and those countries allied with it. Um, whereas, of course, the, the, def the defense of that is that this was absolutely necessary to secure a deal that could prevent war. Um, in Europe, there's a sense that the U.S. has not leaned forward enough to protect those on the Russian periphery from Russian intimidation. The defense is that it has done everything possible within the context of what most NATO powers want. Um, and in Asia, perhaps, at least we can often agree that the, the, the advance in the U.S.-Japan relationship has been something we should all be celebrating, even if one of the presidential candidates is against it. But the main point here is not that anyone has been neglected. It's that there really are very profound disagreements, e even within those sort of the moderate center of each party about the proper future of foreign policy. Let, let me ask a, a follow-up to all of you, um, because it didn't come up. Uh, in, in the context of Japan, uh, when Korea, when South Korea uh, comes up, usually in, in, in relation to Japan, it's always comes up in a context of the history issue. Um, or it comes up in the context of a territorial dispute with Takashima. Uh, but this is from a, a Japanese perspective uh, in terms of sort of the dominant narrative uh, with Japan-Korea relations. But, what I want to ask you, when, when, from an American perspective, when America looks at South Korea, um, how important is it for South Korea and Japan to have improved relations? And how important is it from the United States perspective, for, from, a, from a military uh, perspective specifically, for our two alliances uh, to function in some more operationally uh, effective way? Oh, uh, just very briefly, it's, it's exceptionally important and it, cr it creates opportunities for others to divide those powers that should be cooperating to prevent aggression that um, 
you know, I, I in no way dismiss the seriousness of historical issues and the importance of resolving uh, issues, even about things that happened a very long time ago, because uh, it sends a very important signal to others. If we can reckon honestly with our own history, it makes us trustworthy partners. Um, and actually, you can see the, the positive effects in, in Europe of the countries who have done that, especially Germany, really understanding its role in World War II properly and in the Holocaust. Um, but when there's division, uh, North Korea can exploit that and China can exploit that. It's really the only way to exert effective pressure is for Washington, Tokyo, and Seoul to have a united front and to prepare its responses to the aggression often uh, provoked by uh, Beijing and Pyongyang. Melissa or Rachel, would you like to add something? I would, I would just echo that, that, um, you know, I do think, despite some differences, that there is a convergence of interest when it comes to China and North Korea, the two most significant threats in the region, um, which we, amongst the United States and its two key allies being Japan and, and South Korea. And so the degree to which um, there can be, <coughs> excuse me, greater coordination, greater cooperation from a military and intelligence perspective the, those channels already exist, but I think there's certainly room for improvement. Um, it could help uh, leverage the respective capabilities of all of those involved to bring to bear against these very important um, and significant challenges. The only thing I would add, just, just picking up on, on that last point, um, is that the implementation of a GSOMIA between Japan and Korea would, would be a huge step in that direction and um, could I think you say, a, could you say what a GSOMIA is? is military intelligence sharing agreement um, and the degree or I think a lot of observers from Washington are um, curious to see if the recent uh, agreement between Tokyo and Seoul on the comfort women issue will uh, provide the groundwork for um, serious progress toward greater intelligence sharing.